Let's pray together. Father, that's why we're here, to celebrate you, to adore you, to lift up our thanks to you, that you sent the King of Kings, you sent your Son to come be our Savior. Lord, we thank you for this Christmas season. We thank you that we get to celebrate again these stories that uh, are not just legends that we remember, they're actual history. That our God came, God Emmanuel, God with us. And so even now as we open up your word, I pray that you'd stir in our hearts in a new way. You'd open our minds to what you're doing, not only then, but now in our lives. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. You can be seated. Well, this is an exciting season for us as a church. It's an exciting time of year. I love Christmas time. I love all that it brings and the opportunities around that. I would encourage you, uh, Christmas, our Christmas services are just a couple of weeks away. And I really would encourage you, this is a time of year when people are surveyed in the community. There are many people who don't even go to church or not connected to church that would love to attend a service, a candlelight service. And so take, advantages, uh, take advantage of all the resources. Take advantage of inviting someone. We designed our whole weekend around that. We're not having our normal Sunday morning services. We'll have the three on Sunday afternoon, three on Monday, because we really want to serve our community and give them the opportunity to hear why Jesus came. That not only did he come, but why did he come? And as we celebrate this season, one of my favorite parts about it are the Christmas carols. You sing these old songs that, uh, for me, uh, brings back so much of my childhood. And yet, as you look through them, there's so much truth in them as well. You know, I was reading through the, the verse of O Little Town of Bethlehem. Listen to it. As it says, O Little Town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep the silent stars go by. And this second half of it, yet in thy dark streets shineth the everlasting light. It talks about the light that Jesus brought to the world. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. The hopes that people had had for centuries. The fears. And I might add to it the doubts, the disappointments. That, that all of it came together, as Scripture tells us, in God's perfect timing when Jesus came. If you've got your Bibles, you can turn to Luke chapter 1. As, as we think about Christmas, and we've designed this whole season around family, family Christmas. And when we use that term, I'm not just talking about your family. I'm talking about being family together. Because if there was ever a time of year when you need other people, when you need family, it's Christmas time. And because of that, it can also be one of the times of years where people feel the loneliest, feel the most disconnected, almost struggle that much more because it seems like everybody else is so happy. And I feel stuck in my hopes and fears. You know, as you look at Christmas, it, it points to all that God was doing, the hopes that people had had, not only for that time frame, but through all of human history. It's interesting to me, if you were to begin our story in Luke chapter 1, it's the story of a family and the birth of a son, not Jesus. And remember, there's more to the story than just Jesus' birth. It extends to his cousin as well. In fact, if we were to begin the story, I'd rewind it 400 years. 400 years earlier, picture an old prophet by the name of Malachi as he's writing the final words in the Old Testament, the final prophecy from God. At the very end of Malachi, in chapter 4, he writes these words, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land and de with a decree of utter destruction. The very last words that are written by God, the very last prophecy of the Old Testament says, before the day of the Lord comes, I'm going to send a prophet. He's going to be like Elijah. 
He's going to stir the people in a way and point them to God that it actually impacts homes and families. Turns fathers who've turned away from their children back toward them. Turns children toward their fathers. Brings hope and healing in the land. Those words were written, and then there was no prophecy, no revelation from God for 400 years. Silence. And, and then we pick up in Luke chapter 1, and, and in this story, it's not an old prophet. It's actually an old priest. An older gentleman by the name of Zechariah. And, and it pictures him in Luke chapter 1. He's getting ready for the most significant day in his priestly career. Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth read in Luke 1, if you've got your Bibles, verse 5. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. He had a wife from the daughter of Aaron. So she's from the priestly line as well. Her name was Elizabeth. Note what it says. They were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and both were advanced in age. Interesting combination. You've got this priest, Zechariah, his wife, Elizabeth, and those scripture says they were righteous before God. They were right with God. In fact, it goes on and says they walked blamelessly before the Lord. Now, this doesn't mean, this term blameless, doesn't mean they were perfect people, doesn't mean they never committed sins. What it does mean, though, is they took God at his word. They believed how he had revealed himself. And so they didn't just participate in worship to go through the motion. They really believed that the sacrifices that were presented at the temple, that the worship at the temple, that what God presented in his word was true and they accepted it. And so when they stood before God, God looked at them and said, yes, this is a right couple. This is a blameless couple. It's great praise from God. But then you combine it with the second part of that though. But Elizabeth was barren. They couldn't have children. And you've got to understand, I mean, that is a difficult thing for any couple to face, but especially in that culture. Children were considered the greatest blessing from God. And so if God had withheld that blessing in your life, something must be wrong there. Now, here's the point if you look in your notes there. And I think it's an important principle for us. Blameless living is not a guarantee of all the blessings of life. There's not this guarantee that if I do all the right things, I do it right before God, and I take God His word, and I believe all the right ways, then I'm going to get all the blessings of life. That's just how it works. Now, we know that cognitively, but I think at a heart level, many of us struggle with this. Many of us, even here today, if you were honest about your life, you go, you know, I've been trying to do it the right way. I tried to date the right way. I tried to do my marriage the right way. I've tried to be obedient in that. I've tried to do my career in the right way. All these things, I feel like I've done what God asked me to do, but I'm not experiencing the blessings I see other people have. I've gone through a divorce and I never thought I would. I can't find a spouse who will come do life with me like this. I don't have children like I thought I would. Not in the job I thought I was going to be. We're not financially where I thought I'd be. And, and you can let these frustrations build up, and there's a part of it where you, you look at it and you go, God, I thought if I did what you asked me to do, don't I get this? And you, you can carry these frustrations, and I think Christmas time it actually makes it worse because you look around and it seems like everybody else has their act together. Everybody else's family's great. You look on social media and you know, all these glorious pictures and their glorious life, and I'm not feeling that. And it's even harder in church because we know the right answers, but we struggle with how do I make this work. You got this older priest, Zechariah, and think about it. Here he is. He lives a very public position, but he and his wife carry a private pain together. Now, I told you this was his big day. 
He, he gets dressed because his name has been chosen. You realize there were 18,000 priests throughout the land of Israel. There's only one temple of Solomon in Jerusalem. That was the highest place of worship. That's where there was the holy place and then the holy of holies. And that's where the spirit of God came down and the priest would go. And, and so the priests throughout the land, they had kind of a lottery system. They would draw their names by lot. And, and if you were very blessed, I mean, it was such an honor that if your name ever got drawn, that you got to serve inside the temple. And Zechariah's name has been drawn. And, and he's there, and he's not just in the temple, he is at the altar of incense, which for any priest who was not the high priest, only the high priest could go behind the veil to the Ark of the Covenant. But as a priest, the altar of incense was right next to the veil. And as they burned the incense there, they would burn it and it would represent the prayers of the people. And his job was to lift up the prayers of the people to God. And the incense would go through the veil and the scent of it there represented the prayers going to God. Zechariah was chosen for this honor. And, and he's there and he's at the altar. And look what God does. Look, as it continues on. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. And your wife, Elizabeth, will bear a son, and you shall call his name John. I love the picture of this because as Zechariah is there lifting up the prayers of the people, you know what else he lifted up? The prayers of his heart. The prayers of a couple who still longed for a child. Who were still looking to God. And there's this beautiful intersection of the prayers of the people and the prayers of his heart match exactly with what God was doing. And, and here's where I would challenge you and encourage you. Never give up Never give up bringing the desires of your heart to God. No matter what God's placed on your heart, no matter what you feel in that. This is one of the reasons I think this couple stayed blameless before God. Because in those years of, of frustration, of longing, instead of pulling back from God, instead of resenting God over it, they continued to bring it to God. And I, I would encourage you Maybe you're in a place of frustration. Maybe you're in a place where it's hurting right now. Maybe life hasn't worked like you thought it would. And, and there's a temptation in that moment, instead of bringing that to God, to pull back from him. To almost resent him. Or just go ahead and disqualify yourself. You know, I've talked to people before, and, and sometimes as, you, as you're talking to them, you get down to the root issue, what's really going on inside what they really want, what they really desire. And I'll ask them, well, do you pray about that? And they've already determined God doesn't want me to have that. No, I don't deserve that. It's not going to happen. And I often say, so you went ahead and just made that decision for him. Now hear me. I'm not saying, oh, you pray, you're guaranteed to get it. But I am saying this, in that conversation with God, it keeps you from allowing that disappointment to grow. I have seen blameless people become bitter people. And it's not a long journey. That life turns. Something happens. And instead of continuing to have that honest conversation with God, they pull back from God. And they pull back from the people of God. They pull back from their friends. And you look up and you go, what happened? I would implore with you today, if you are in this place of struggle, tell God. Tell him what you really feel. T tell him what's really on your heart. Be honest with him. He knows, but in the conversation, it's amazing the connection that you continue with him, even in the pain of life, as you share that with him. Now, in this case, Gabriel looks at him and says, Hey, Zechariah, your prayers have been heard. You're going to have a son. And I, you know, in that moment, he's got to be so excited. I'm going to have a son. The son we always dreamed of. 
you got to remember, he's a priest. His wife comes from a line of priests. And if you're a priest, there's no greater dream than my son is going to be a priest too. We're going to have a son. Except Gabriel says, no, no, you're not going to have a priest. You're going to have a prophet. A little bit different. The priests were the ones that represented the people before God. Prophets were the ones that represented God to the people. The prophets weren't always real popular. They were a little different. In fact, Gabriel says, Zechariah, you, you, you're going to need to raise this boy a little bit differently. He's been set apart for, for a divine function. But then he gives this exciting news. He's not just any prophet. In fact, look how Gabriel describes him. He will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the father to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Do you hear what he's referring to? He says, you're not just going to have a prophet, you're going to have the prophet that Malachi wrote about. The, the last prophecy that came from God. That's going to be your son. He's going to go and prepare the way. He's going to point out and be the one that points the salvation that comes. I mean, that'd be pretty exciting news, wouldn't it? I mean, just picture for a moment. You're Zechariah. You're in the temple. It's already this sensory overload. There, there's the, the golden candlesticks and the table of showbread. And you got the incense before and the high priest that's going back behind the curtain. And, and you're there and you're in the middle of worship. And the angel shows up. He says, your prayers have been answered. And you're going to have a son. He's going to be a prophet, not just any prophet. Prophet Malachi was talking about. That's exciting stuff, isn't it? What's Zechariah's response? Look at it. A little less than overwhelming here. Zechariah says to the angel, well, how shall I know this? For I'm an old man. My wife's advanced in years. Not really what I was expecting there. I mean, this is pretty amazing revelation. And yet there's part of me that can understand it. Here would be the point. Even good people struggle with doubt and disappointment. Even blameless people. Even the people of God. When you go through enough years with certain pain, you can hit a point where doubt kind of just settles in. You know, you wouldn't know it looking at our family now. I mean, God's blessed us with this big family, seven kids, all different. We had kids and adopted. And, but it was nine years of marriage before we had a child. And five years of that was infertility, going through all with it. And I'm telling you that there's few things that are more painful in life as a couple. And, and, and the frustration that builds around it is Here's your heart's desire. God, I want a good thing. I'm not asking for something bad. I want a child. And month after month, the tears and the pain. Now picture if you go through a lifetime of that, when that settles in. And, and, and it's not just infertility. It can be all different seasons of life, all different dreams of life, all different things you hope for, good things that you wanted. And when it doesn't happen, you can reach a place where, where you doubt. You just live with disappointment. And maybe the hardest place to carry that is church. Because you come here and we're supposed to all have the right answers and live the right lives. And it's hard to be honest enough with others. What do I do with this? Now, in Zechariah's case, I want you to see Gabriel's response. Because he's looking at, I mean, Zechariah got something that not many of us get. You actually get an angel to show up to tell you about it. In fact, I love the way Gabriel puts it. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I mean, that's his way of saying, I'm kind of a big deal. And he is. He's not just any angel. He, he's of the highest order. He says, I am Gabriel. 
my day job, Zechariah, is I stand in the presence of God. I, I'm with God all the time. I'm not a minion. I'm not one of the low-level guys. This is a big deal here. And I was sent to speak to you and bring you this good news. You're not getting it, so in order that you get it, behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. Now, now here's what I want you to grasp in that because you can read that and you go, man, why the strong response? It's okay to struggle with what we hope God will do. There's many things we hope for and we don't know for sure. And it's okay to struggle with that. But hear me on this. Never doubt what he says he will do. Take him at his word. And and, and Gabriel looks at him and says, hey, Zach, I know you've struggled with this for years. You've wanted this for years. You've asked God about this for years. And now God has told you this is going to happen. And I would encourage you, the promises of God you can bank on. If Christmas teaches us anything, if Christmas teaches us anything, it's that God keeps his promises. See, all the way through the Old Testament, there were all these promises about what Jesus was going to do, about where he would be born, about the kind of life he would live, about, about the way that he would die. And every single one of those promises were fulfilled in him. God kept his word on every part, even going back to Malachi when he said, before Jesus comes, I'm going to bring a prophet to come. And Zechariah's son, John, became that prophet. And so if you're here today, and maybe you're wrestling with the frustration, maybe you're wrestling with heartache. And it's easy in those moments to allow the doubt of that situation to start creeping into a point that you start doubting everything that God said. That's why I think it's so vital, and, and, and as a church, that's why I think it's so important that we actually act like family. We don't just use that term. That you're allowed to struggle here. You're allowed to have a place that, that when you're in your season of disappointment, you don't have to walk in here and everybody's got their act together. Isn't it interesting? We, we've got this image that church is a place you come once you have your act together. I, I've talked to people before and I'm like, oh, you ought to come to church. And they're like, oh, I couldn't come to church. My life's a mess. And I'm like, you ought to come. You'd fit right in. <laughs> really? All of our lives are a mess. None of us have this together. That's why Jesus came. And that's why we need each other. And and, and we need to be family in a way because as you walk through life enough, there will be seasons where your life is so blessed and you feel so in tune with everything God's doing and somebody right next to you, they're in a season of doubt and disappointment. And this should be the place that we bear each other's burdens. We talk honestly with God about the desires of our heart, but we also talk honestly with each other. We lift each other up and we carry each other in those seasons. There was a seminary professor years ago, a man named Hans, he taught in Europe. And he had to flee Europe and came to the States and he taught in a seminary here, sweet gentleman. His students loved him. And he and his wife, Enid, they were just this sweet couple that every evening you would see them walking the seminary grounds. They would hold hands with each other and just walk together until Enid became sick and then she died. And Hans got depressed. And the seminary professor and three of his friends, the president and three of the professors who were friends, they came to his door and they they said, Hans, we're worried about you. You're not eating. We never see you out walking. We want to pray with you. And he said, I'll I'll be honest. I don't think I can pray with you. I don't know that I even believe in God anymore. They were silent for a moment. And then the president spoke up and he said, okay. Then we will pray for you. We will make confession for you. We will believe for you. 
And they would come every day, those four friends, and they'd gather around Hans, and they would pray for him. Until about three months later, when they gathered and Hans opened the door and he smiled at them. He said, today you don't have to pray for me. Today you can pray with me. Because I can pray again. Because I believe. Guys, that's what community, that's what life in the family of God looks like. You will have times where you're the person praying for. And you will have times where you need the people gathered around you. In all of it, we need each other. And we need God. Now, in Zechariah's story, he had some time to think about it because he was silent. He says he came out of the temple and he couldn't say a word and they knew something had happened in there. And you think about it, it, it had to be a little embarrassing. I mean, you walk out, you're a priest, you can't talk to anyone. He goes home to Elizabeth. He can write out to her, but he can't tell her and speak with it. Nine months of being silent. You imagine how hard that would be to not say a word? Nine months where your spouse had to be silent. Now, some of you just got a little excited about that. That's, that's... <laughs> you really couldn't perform any of your priestly functions with the people. But it gave him time to think. To think about what God was doing. You fast forward in the text nine months later, if you look at it, down in verse 57. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son, and her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. And on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child. And they would have called him Zachariah after his father, but his mother answered, no, he shall be called John. They said to her, none of your relatives is called by this name. And they made signs to his father inquiring what he wanted him to be called. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, his name is John. And they all wondered. And immediately his mouth was open, his tongue was loose, and he spoke, blessing God. So the people have all gathered. John is born, or the baby's born. On the eighth day when they would circumcise a child, that's also when they would declare the name. You got to remember, the family all gathers together, and this is a family of priests. I mean, he's of the line of Abijah. She's of the line of Aaron. You've had a son. Every priest that would have a son, your son's going to be a priest as well. Let's give him a good priestly name like Zechariah, like dad. This is just what you do. And mom speaks up and says, no, he's going to be a little different. His name is John. And, and you we're not feeling it as much as they would have culturally there, but they all like John. And they look to dad, surely you're going to do something about this. He's not a John. And, and he gets a tablet and he goes, his name is John. See, so somewhere in the nine months, Zechariah has really embraced what God is doing. And, and maybe his son's not the priest he dreamed of, but he's the prophet, the prophet that was needed. See, during this time when he had to be silent, instead of just using it as a time to pull back, he used it as a time to go deep, to reflect what God was doing in his life. Here's what I would challenge you. Every season of setback is a great opportunity for spiritual discernment and growth. Every season a setback. And, and maybe you're in that season. Maybe it's a time of pruning in your life. Maybe it's a time of struggle in your life. Maybe it's a time where, where you don't understand what and why God is doing what he's doing. And instead of allowing it to be a seedbed that just grows more doubt and more frustration, what if you step back and you say, okay, God, I'm going to keep declaring the desires of my heart, but I want to learn what you're doing through this as well. I want to see your hand in this. I want to embrace your leading, no matter what it is. You know, one of my heroes is Corey Ten Boom. 
God used her in an amazing way. She and her family, who during World War II, they took in Jews and hid them, and they were discovered. And because of that, she and her family, she and her sister were sent to a concentration camp. Her parents were killed. And while she was there at Ravensbrook, in this concentration camp, in the barracks there, she struggled with her faith. Her sister Betsy had such a strong faith and influence in her life. And in their barracks, they had an outbreak of fleas. And it was kind of the final straw for Corey. She's like, it's bad enough to be here. Now we're, we're eating up with fleas. And Betsy said, well, Corey, Scripture says thank God for everything. So we're going to thank him for the fleas. And Corey's like, no, I'm not thanking God for fleas. But Betsy said, let's thank God. Interesting thing happened during that time. The guards who would often just break into the barracks, torture and violate the women there, they stopped going in that barrack. In fact, they, they had enough solitude as a barrack, they were able to start leading Bible studies with the Bible that had been smuggled in. Many women started coming to Christ. Corey would find out later the reason the guards didn't go into the barrack, they didn't want to get fleas. And so they left them alone. She would look back on it and say, God, thank you even for the fleas. You knew what you were doing. I don't know what God's doing in your life, but he does. And, and if you're in that season of setback now, it can be hard during Christmas time. But it also could be a great time of growth and discernment. But it's going to take you, continue to take your request to him. Continuing to talk to him. Talk to others in community, to your small group, to other people in your life. To, to embrace that he has a plan that, that he knows more than we know. One of the things I love about Zechariah, he ends this passage with his song. It's an incredible passage. I mean, it shows me how much during this nine months he's been reflecting on what God is doing. He's been soaking it in. And then he does this song of revelation that every line of it, we don't have time to go through it, but if you'll read through the rest of the passage, you'll see how he just keeps pointing to Jesus and what Jesus would do. And then at the very end of it, he doesn't just talk about Jesus, he talks about his son. In fact, he speaks to his boy, his eight-day-old boy, John, right there. Look what he says to him. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people and the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. He says, God's doing something new. God's moving again in a way that he hasn't for 400 years. God is bringing light into this world, and he's going to use you. And notice what he calls his son. You will be a prophet. And maybe it's not what I dreamed of all these years. And, and hear me, John lives a life that's different. I mean, you read about John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin. Uh, he, he's just a different cat. He lived out in the wilderness. It says he ate locust and honey. Had a coat, a camel hair coat. And I'm not talking about, you know, a Nordstrom's nice camel hair blazer, guys. I'm talking about a straight off the camel hair coat. <laughs> not really what they had probably dreamed. But it's exactly what the world needed. Here's what I would encourage you as you take your request to God. Trust that God will give us what we need even more than what we want. Trust that in God's plan, he knows exactly what we need. And, and sometimes that's hard because we hold so tightly to what we want, it's hard to see anything else. And, and, and as you are in this season... Maybe the greatest step of trust and growth 
I'm not saying let go of the desires of your heart. Keep bringing them to God. But as you lay them before them, ask him, is this what I need? And I trust you, God, to provide in your time, in your plan, exactly what's needed. And the reason you can trust him is because of what Zechariah said. He sent my boy to be a prophet for the light of the world that's coming. And I love the way he described it. He said, because we have a God who shows us, and he doesn't just say mercy, he said, who shows us tender mercy. And that'd be my final point with you. As you think about Christmas, remember Christmas is about God's tender mercy in life. See, the reason I can trust him to provide what I need is I look at how he has provided in the past. I look at how he's provided in the world. I look that, that he not only sent salvation, he came personally. He brought light to people that were trapped in darkness. And he extended mercy, not just mercy, tender mercy. I can extend mercy from afar, but to give tender mercy... You have to do that up close. You have to be here. And Patrick Hannon talks about a Christmas Eve one year in Portland. He's working at a shelter. It was a soup kitchen. And when they opened up that night on Christmas Eve, he, he was a little shocked, all of them were, how long the line of homeless people were waiting out in the cold to get something to eat. And as the line started to come in and they were serving the soup, they just kept looking at their Supplies that were there and they were praying, oh Lord, I hope there's enough. I hope there's enough. And, and when he got to the bottom of the last pot, he was relieved to look up. There was one last guy in line, a regular, big Ben, big hulk of a man. And so he, he took the remnants of that pot and was able to fill a bowl to the brim. With a smile, he handed it to Ben. And Ben took it and he smiled back at him no teeth, but he smiled back at him and took his bowl and went to sit down and eat. And as soon as he turned to move, they didn't realize that right behind Big Ben there was one more person. It's a teenager. Skinny, shivering from the cold. He had a fresh black eye. And when he looked and saw the empty pot, his eyes kind of opened and they started to well with tears. And Patrick and everybody there started reaching in their pockets, see, surely we have some money or something. And then he looked up and he saw Ben had walked back over. He'd seen the boy. And Ben took his bowl of soup and presented it to him. Act of mercy. Then he did something else took his hand and he reached up and he just placed it on his head like a father to a son. Just held it there for a second and then rustled his hair, smiled, and walked away. Patrick said on a cold night to see this act of mercy and love from one to another. Guys, Ben gave mercy, not just mercy, tender mercy, because he knew what it was like to be hungry. He knew what that boy was feeling. He was one of them. So, so when Zechariah says that our God extends tender mercy, hear me. He extends it because he was one of us. He lived among us. He knows every disappointment. He knows every struggle. He knows every rejection. He knows every temptation. He knows every pain. Because Emmanuel, God with us, he came to be with us. 
And from among us, he leads us into the light. Wherever you are today, whatever you're struggling with, whether you've lived a life where you're right and blameless before God, but you're still struggling, or maybe you've been so far from God. Christmas, Christmas is about his mercy, tender mercy to you, to me. It's about light for people who find themselves in dark places. And the God who kept his promises of the past is the God who keeps his promises today. Talk to him. Trust him. Talk to somebody else here. Invite them into your journey and your life. So that when we talk about being family, we actually embrace this is what family does. Because we have a father of tender mercy who loves us so much. Let's pray together.